would um, open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We will get done with the study this morning. <clears throat> I promise. I know it's been uh, going on for three weeks, but it's kind of hard to squeeze everything in in a half hour or less every Sunday. I'm just not used to that because we used to go like 45 minutes and a little bit longer in the teachings. I still haven't been able to do the condensed thing. So as we started our study, I believe it was um, January 2nd of uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the title was and remains the same, this year I resolve to. And so bringing up the, the point that uh, many people uh, love to make New Year's resolutions. You know, that's the one time of the year when they put their cards on the table and say, yes, this is so important to me, now that I'm gonna enter a new year, I'm gonna do this. And I would venture to say that most of those New Year's resolutions turn into next year's resolutions. They, they don't grow feet, they don't go forward, they just kind of fertilize and, and drop to the ground. And so what I had asked a few weeks ago is for you to fill in the blank. This year I resolve to what? And for me, the important thing as a shepherd, the more important thing as a lover of Christ, the important thing is somebody called by his name and saved by the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. I have to ask these questions. So what will we do with Jesus corporately? What will you do with Jesus individually as I look at you? And, and this is the most important question I believe that I have of these three, because it's personal, what will I do with Jesus? See, corporately, we can desire to do one thing. As a, a discipler um, of those who are in Christ, I can ask you to do something. But what is most important is that we as individuals make that decision of what we're going to do with Jesus. See, most of us, not all of us, but our parents, and in that, we know that for our children, we we have had, still have many desires for them to do this, this, and that. And we can pray, we can conjole, we can take and try and um, do those things that prompt our children or grandchildren or loved ones to do what we want them to do. But bottom line is, unless it's their choice, and unless it's their decision, it, it's still something we want them to do, but they're not going to go forward in that. And so as we conclude our study this morning, Jesus has sent, depending on your translations, he's uh, sent either 70 or 72 out into the surrounding area to proclaim his coming. Literally what he says is, I don't want you to rely upon physical means that you're used to. I don't want you to take a knapsack, I don't want you to take food, I don't want you to take money, I don't want you to take sandals to put on your feet. I want you focused on the message that you're to bring to those that are perishing, the message of the good news. I want you to be sowers of the good news. So many times we, we don't really want to be sowers, we want to be the reapers, right? Well, you know, others can sow, I'll, yeah, I'll just reap them out of the thing, and I think that's really not a biblical way to look at that because we're to be sowers, not reapers. He's the one that takes and, and brings forward the, the fruit, brings forward those uh, unto salvation and uh, the one who knows the wheat from the chaff that, that we really don't know. And so as these 70 are called out to spread the gospel of the good news and to um, really take and proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God, it's important that we understand that that's what we're to do. We're to be good table setters. We're to be good table waiters. And in that, simply bringing forth the good news of the gospel of salvation to those that are perishing. And we can look around in this day and age, and I'm not going to say that we are a special 
uh, in a special season of life that nobody else has ever been in. I think I'd be foolish to say that. But what I think I can say with some accuracy is we're in a season of life that is completely foreign to those who um, came before us and is unique to those that are here right now, the different things that are going on. And however you want to process that, we need to be the voice of those crying out, Jesus is coming. Jesus desires that you have a personal relationship with him. Jesus desires that you receive the word of God, that you might be forgiven of your sins and saved. And I think that's what the message um, is the past two weeks, last week, and and this morning, reading out of Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, Jesus speaking, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For a lot of us, eternity is a, a concept yet to be fully, I guess, dealt with. Uh, eternity is uh, a concept that I'm talking about intellectually, not spiritually. Uh, it, it's a concept that uh, we hear of others um, either uh, entering into eternity, those facing the prospects of entering into eternity. But for a lot of us, the ushering in of eternity in the lives of those whom we love and those who we know, it's a pretty real daily thing. It's a, it's a moment by moment um, event that we participate in. I'll be honest with you, just before I came up here, my phone dinged. And I told Janet all morning, I said, I'm so thankful that my phone has not dinged this morning. Because my phone during school, when I'm with the kids, uh, when I'm at home, and I'm not saying this because of my importance, I just, I'm just one of those guys, I got a lot of people that are blessed to have in my life. But my phone's been dinging a lot. And it's been digging for prayer. It's been digging to inform me that folks have entered into eternity. It's, it's been digging oh, all kinds of different messages. But this morning I got a ding from a close friend that I went to high school with who's in the hospital. And he dinged to um, let me know that um, he was doing okay. And what that ding told me is that God had not ushered him at this moment into eternity, which I'd be grateful for. You know? Man loves the Lord. But what it told me is he's still on this side. And he's still going forward. And so for these 70 that that were sent out, these 70 that were given a pretty specific direction, these 70 that were told, you know what, when you go to a certain house and Perhaps they don't have what you're used to eating or they're not the type of environment you're used to being in. Don't, don't leave the house and go see if you can find a better meal deal someplace. Just stay where I got you. Receive what I have for you. Be a blessing to those that, those that are struggling, those that want to receive the gospel. Perhaps even be a testimony to those who don't that perhaps down the road their, their hearts might be changed. So I want to start out reading through our study this morning. I'm going to start out at verse 8 of chapter 10 of the Gospel of Luke. This is Jesus speaking through the entirety of our study this morning. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. And heal the sick there and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. 
Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. Verse 12. But I say to you that it would be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Woe to you, Corazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects me, and he who rejects me, rejects him who sent me. When we bring the gospel of the good news of the coming of Jesus Christ, that he came and walked amongst us, he came and took upon him our sins on the cross, that he died, that he rose, that he ascended to be with the Father, that he, he himself said, I must go that a better may come, and that better is the Holy Spirit, that, which is given to every new believer at the time that they are saved. When, when Jesus did those things and accompany, or accomplished those things, he did those things in spite of us, not because of us. It was the will of the Father for it was the will of the Father for him to go to the cross. It was the will of the Father for him to die. It was the will of the Father for him to have the sins of the world upon him. And in that, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, sometimes we uh, don't speak of the unity of the Godhead three and one. But as the 70 went forward to proclaim Jesus's coming, that the kingdom of God was coming. Some were received, others were cast aside, and still many others were mocked. And I don't think that's any different for us today as we bring the gospel to those that are perishing. Starting our study in verses 8 and 9 this morning, Jesus says, Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things that are set before you, and heal the sick there, and say to them, The kingdom of God has come near you. They were called to take forward the gospel, and they were called to heal. We don't see that at the end of Matthew. We're simply told to bring forward the gospel. There's nothing in there that says, you go out and heal. Bring the gospel out, and you go out and heal. That's the purview of God. That's the purview of his workings, the Trinity. But we are to take forward the gospel, and for these that went out the 70, they were instructed to heal the sick. They were instructed to tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. And as they go forward and they bring the word of God to those that are perishing, do you remember what it was like for you when you had no idea who God was? You were at enmity with him, and, and the next moment you were one of his children? Do you remember that, how that's so flipped and how that's so dramatically changed. And so as these 70 went forth and they gave the word of life out, as they went forth and they healed those that were sick, can you imagine the excitement within those towns? The excitement within those homes? The fellowship that burst forward out of healing, out of eternal life, out of knowing that Jesus loved you enough to send 70 out to proclaim the good news of the gospel? And he tells them, eat such things as are set before you. Don't worry about these legalistic things that formerly separated uh, men from the things they might eat or they might do. He said, you know what? Whatever is given to you, partake and trust in the Lord. That it would be for his glory and your good. Reading out of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. We're told, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm, and be filled, 
that you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Not only did Jesus tell them to trust, but James reiterates the fact that our faith is a fruitless faith if it's not a faith that doesn't bear works. Once again, I know some people can twist this around, and I just, I always say this, I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstood. No matter how much you work, no matter how much you try, no matter how much you partake, no matter how much you give, no matter how much you're involved in, your works are not going to save you. And if you think your works are going to keep you saved, that's an even worse understanding. You're saved by the grace of God through faith. And that grace is you, by faith, accept what he has done and who he is, should result in the pouring out of good works. And that's to his glory, for your good, and that isn't that you look and go, oh, I did that, I must be saved. Well, no, that isn't quite how that works. You're given the Holy Spirit so that you know that you are saved. You don't have to look at the externals, you have to understand the internal. At the day of Pentecost, every new believer from that moment to now and in the future is given the Holy Spirit upon salvation. And that's not going to go away. Verses 10 and 11 of our study this morning, Jesus continues, But whatever city you enter and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, The very dust of your city which clings to us we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God is come near you. See, they went to many cities, and the many cities that they went to, some of them did not receive them. Some of the cities just said, hey, we got nothing to do with you. Get out of Dodge, if it wasn't the name of the town, but it works. Get out of Dodge, we don't want you here. So what these disciples would do is have an outward show of what was going on in the hearts of this uh, town, the hearts of these people inwardly. They'd go out and they'd wipe the dust off their feet. They would take and remove the remnant of even being in that town from their bodies. But listen to what would be said after they did that. Jesus says, nevertheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. So there's an outward showing to them that they did not receive, an outward showing that we want nothing to do with your unbelief. We're just going to get rid of the dust off of our feet. Nevertheless, Jesus said, tell them that the kingdom of God has come. So many times, and, and I'm assuming in, in all of our lives, not just mine, uh, the kingdom of God came near to me. Whether it was at Elsinore High, whether it was uh, at my parents' house in San Fernando Valley, whether it was out on the job site when I had construction business out here, or within the, uh, the dairy when I was milking cows in the old days, or uh, just the many things that I did the kingdom of God came near to me many times. Many people brought the gospel. Many people uh, told me about Jesus Christ. And, and you know what? I didn't receive. And, and I think figuratively, they did the same thing. They wiped the dust off their feet. So I didn't want anything to do with Jesus. This guy is so hard-hearted. And like I said, I want to include everybody in that. You guys have a chance to do class participation if you're hard-hearted. But you know what? They received a truth, although they did not, well, they heard a truth, although they did not receive it. They heard the truth, although they did not understand it, and you never know what God is going to do down the road with that. Verse 12 of our study this morning, but I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Well, remember Sodom. 
Sodom felt the full weight of God's judgment and fury and wrath. Felt the full weight of that. And what Jesus is saying is that the judgment that these people, these towns, would feel would be far fiercer than the judgment that Sodom felt. Because Sodom had what kind of knowledge? Itty bitty knowledge, right? And these other towns that Jesus is going to bring up, they had a greater knowledge of who Jesus was, what Jesus proclaimed to do. And the Old Testament saints, we, we have to remember that they saw dimly through the lens of Christ. And I'm not saying Christ isn't spoken of in the New Testament or the Old Testament. It's the continuous thread through both the canon of Scripture. Old Testament, New Testament, Christ is spoken of. But for us as New Testament believers, the rose has blossomed. The full fragrance of Christ has come forward. We understand so much more the intimacy that we have with the Almighty through Jesus Christ than the Old Testament saints did. And they were, they were godly, they were godly folk. By faith they believed, and that was what counted to them as righteousness. But what verse 12 tells us here, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that sitting. Speaking of Sodom, reading out of Genesis 19, verses 23 through 27. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zor. Then the Lord rained fire and brimstone, fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from, uh, from the Lord out of heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went out early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land, which went up like smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of his midst, out of the midst of the overflow, or the overthrow, and when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. See, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming for those who don't know the Lord. And I think Spurgeon, I'm going to butcher this, so forgive, forgive me, Mr. Spurgeon. Spurgeon says, if there are many who desire to hurdle themselves into hell, may we, the saints, be there at the precipice with outstretched arms pleading with each one of them to accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, it's a simple thing to understand that God so loved, that he so gave, that we so have. That's a pretty simple thing to embrace if we're saved, right? I mean, it's, it, it's a pretty easy thing to get if we're saved. You know what? God so loved me that he did this. Jesus so loved God that he did that. And, and now I'm a, a child of God. And, and that's the simplicity of the gospel, is we get it if we have it. But remember back to when you didn't have it? When you didn't have it, it wasn't so easy to get, was it? When you didn't have it, you looked at those that were bringing the gospel of the good news as intruders. You looked at those bringing the gospel of the good news as those that simply needed a crutch to get through life. You needed... You, you looked at those that brought the gospel and thought, well, I guess that's what you need to do to find favor in God's eyes and work your way to heaven. See, on the other side of salvation, 
you know, we didn't know who Jesus Christ was, and it wasn't so easy. On this side, knowing, knowing that we're saved, it's pretty easy to understand what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And, and as these 70 were, were sent out, they would have proclaimed that good news. I said this before, I'm going to say it again, and if I'm like a broken record, I apologize. But we as the saved have something that those as the unsaved don't have. We do. And we shouldn't rest upon it, we shouldn't use it, we shouldn't make sure it's a crutch, but we've got to be cognizant of it. You as a believer know things many things that the unbelievers don't, right? Right? You, you know a whole plethora of God's love for you that they haven't even experienced, they can't even know, and they don't even want to know. But the upside of that is you also, as a sinner saved by grace and still a sinner, you can remember back when you were swimming in the gutter of the world. You can remember back prior to Christ when you were a mud hen in the issues of life. So, so you know what they know. Not that you live what you used to know, but you know what they know, and you know why they don't want to accept. But you also know what the grace of God feels like. And you know what, as you go forward and bring that forward, just trust the Lord. Give him the gospel and let him be the one who reaps. Give him the gospel and you be a sower. You just take and spread the gospel of the good news, verses four, or 13 through 16 of our study this morning. Scripture says, Jesus speaking, What are you, Corazon? What are you, Bethsaida? For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So see what company we just got put in? We got put in with the company of the Lord and Jesus. And you know what? If they reject you, that's okay. They rejected him. If they don't want to listen to you, that's okay. They don't want to listen to him. We're, we're not to be those people who have our egos bruised by those who refuse or those who belittle or those who deny or those who simply want to uh, intellectualize uh, what they know versus uh, becoming those who would know spiritually what the Lord is doing. We, we can't be concerned with those things, right? Was Jesus mocked? Was he stood upon? Was he belittled? I mean, if, if the creator of all things, if that's his lot in life, why should we expect our lot to be any different, right? Sometimes we do that. I'm Jesus, it's almost special chicken. Nothing can touch me. Splat. Where'd that come from? Well, that's life. Just hit you square in the fort. Not supposed to happen, I'm his. Well, guess what? Life happens to all of us. Good happens to all of us, and things that we don't view as good happens to all of us. But as Christians, what we need to keep in the forefront of our mind, and our thoughts, and in our daily life, is there is not one thing, not one tiny little thing that touches us that doesn't have to get through the hand of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Nothing. If there is, guess what? He's no longer sovereign. And if he's no longer sovereign, he's no longer God with a big G. And if he's no longer God with a big G, it all comes tumbling it down, which it doesn't. So as they went forward, as they proclaimed the gospel, as Jesus said that those who had little knowledge, has little knowledge, but those who had great knowledge, it would be, it would be, a harsher judgment or a different judgment or or an intolerable judgment upon them go forward bring the gospel people are hurting people are dying and it's not um it's not the death 
the physical death that's the bummer. It's the eternal death that's the bummer. And so in that, um, you don't get a do-over when you enter into eternity. Somebody doesn't meet you on your way in and say, hey, the lottery going here. All you got to do is grab a ticket and you might have a chance. No, it doesn't work that way. The moment of death, you go one way or the other. Go straight into the arms of Jesus or you go straight into the chaos of hell. And that's, that's a pretty big deal. And for us this day, let's resolve to bring forward the gospel of the good news, if nothing else. Let's resolve to live as Christ. And when we don't, thank goodness for confession and repentance and restoration. Amen.